let's learn. So this is a very holy book. Now a little word of warning. Tonight's quite hardcore and tonight, we've got to work out how we apply it for you. Here's the problem. We're now on to chapter 20. This whole book is a very holy book in terms of how you achieve your spiritual potential. So just imagine, right? There's 49 rocks spiritually that we can all spend time going up and down. Can you imagine you at rung 35, how awesome and great that is? And then you get to 40 and 40. So, so over here, chapter 20 is very high up already. We're, we're, you know, we're over two thirds high up. So he's going to give us some insights that once you've already achieved so many things, you need to work on what he calls mishkal chasidut, assessing piety. So here's, here's the problem. He's going to speak about the importance of now you're so holy and so enlightened and so learned and so knowledgeable. Now, actually, you need to activate common sense. And we're going to speak about the importance of just general common sense and learning how to assess, to understand how to balance one's spirituality with, on one hand, the Torah, reality, life, where you're holding. And why many of you, I feel... We shouldn't just jump in to say, oh, all I need to do is common sense. It's common sense post an awful lot of knowledge. Once you've got an awful lot of knowledge, an enormous amount of knowledge, a lot of Torah behind you, then the job is to activate that common sense. But right here and now, if, for example, you're faced with a dilemma and you're just going straight for the common sense, it might be common sense to you right here, right now, but it's, if it's not based on knowledge, if it's not based on reams and vast volumes of Torah, then you might not actually be getting to the correct conclusion. So what we're getting at is step one, a lot of knowledge is needed. When you've hit this tremendous amount of knowledge, then you have to activate this branch of common sense to balance it all out. So I don't want to, this is my caveat tonight. What we're saying tonight shouldn't preclude you having a journey of learning as much as possible. And, and by the way, therefore, if you're faced with a dilemma, what you're meant to do, any of you at any stage can ask for my WhatsApp. Many of you have it. And if you've got a question, call me. And that's what the rabbi is there for. It's okay, I'll say, Rab, you should make for yourself a rabbi. Or if you've got any other, there's some great rabbis around this planet, speak to a rabbi. And when you have a dilemma, it, it, first and foremost, ask the question. Ask the question. Eventually, hopefully you'll become so knowledgeable and become so learned that we give you the instinct to be able to work things out for yourself as well. And this is really where we're holding in this chapter. So what we're saying is this chapter already assumes an awful lot of knowledge. So now we're there. So just imagine that we are now on this holy level of chapter 20, where we've already got purity and we've got cleanliness and we've got introspection and we've <laughs> separation piety so you've now literally near the top of your spiritual ladder now we read it but obviously what we're going to say tonight will be relevant to you because we're very blessed that every week there's standalone material which you're going to gain from so don't go anywhere there'll be something you'll hear tonight which is exactly what Hashem needed you to hear for your spiritual growth this week so don't go anywhere for the next 50 minutes because there will be some jewels, some gems, which is exactly what you needed to hear for where you're holding today. So even though there's like this long-term vision of trying to the, by the end of your life to hit your highest spiritual level, this week, or even maybe today or tomorrow, there's going to be some, some Torah you're going to hear tonight, which is pivotal and invaluable for your spiritual 24-7 period. So here we go. Says the Ramchal. By the way, maybe James, if you want to put it on the Zoom, but someone, I can see there's a few first timers here. So welcome to the first timers. We like rookies, welcome. You know, it only gets easy, everybody. Don't, don't um, run a mile. And if it's the first time, you've got to join us with a Lachaim. That's part of, that's part of the habit. So Lachaim, everybody, Lachaim. I've made a blessing already for those who like to ask. Lachaim, Larry's got his cocktail. What even is that? Larry, it's like a pomegranate. Okay, so... Here we go. So if you go to Safari, if you want to look it up inside, I think on Safari, James will put the link. Hopefully you can actually hopefully see Path of the Just chapter 20 inside, but you can take my word for it. I'm not lying. I'm just saying to you what he's saying. Here we go. Says the Ramchal. What needs to be explained at this point is how to assess the nature of this kind of piety. 
It's a matter of highest importance. You should be aware that in actuality, it's the most difficult aspect of piety because of the subtleties, meaning one thing is to be pious. The next thing is nice to see you, Natalie, on, on Instagram. Next thing is, how do you apply it to your life? Meaning, let's try and read a few analogies. So now let's just imagine. Everybody just imagine, okay? Let's just do this a minute. You ready? Close your eyes. Let's do a bit of meditation for a minute. Close your eyes. Just relax. Breathe in. Breathe out. Let's try and get to a higher level of consciousness. So we are learning from the level of what's called Das. Das is, is a very high, high, high place of consciousness, which is really how we should be interacting with each other. So just relax. Now start visualizing you at your highest level. Or maybe to get you in the mood this week, Cedric, we spoke about Moshe Rabbeinu. Just imagine what Moshe Rabbeinu would look like in his father-in-law, Yisro. Could you imagine, imagine the Ten Commandments. Imagine you were there at the Ten Commandments, hearing Hashem say, I am Hashem, your God. Three million of us heard the Ten Commandments. Just imagine being there for a moment. So you're in this very holy place. So now come away from that to so your holy. Now, now, how do you deal with that level of holiness in a world of reality? How do you... You know, Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon by Yochai, when he was in the cave, 12 years learning with an angel, when he came out, he couldn't cope with society. He was giving people looks. They were dying, literally, the Talmud says. He, he, he couldn't deal with sin. He couldn't deal with inconsistency, with hypocrisy. So how do we deal with society? How do we deal with friends, family, loved ones, not perhaps behaving the way that now you want to behave? Let's say you're in a place where you don't want to hear Lashon Hara. You don't want to hear gossip. You don't want to hear evil slander, but yet you go around to your friends, to your family, and you're hearing it. How do you deal with that? So instead of like torching down the house, right? And 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 saying, Oh, you bunch of heathens, I'm never going to speak to you ever again. That is not the way to do it. That is not the way to do it. So, how does one deal with you on that high level of holiness? But there's life and there's reality and there's business. So, how do you deal with it? So he says like this. There's a lot of subtleties. And he says, the Yeid Sahara, I'm going to teach you a phrase tonight. Some of you know, I think Larry knows this phrase I like to use. There's a concept called the from Yeit Sahara. What does that mean? Again, for the first time, let me try and translate. The way Hashem made us is to have free will. Otherwise, there's no point of being here. We are higher than angels. Angels don't have free will. We have free will. The way free will works is Hashem creates us with a soul which wants to cleave to God and do the right thing. But then Hashem creates us with our nemesis or self-sabotage voice, which is called, anyone? As we know, the, you can type it in, Yetzahara, which is the evil inclination, the lower self. Then God also gives us the Yetzatov, the good inclination, which I believe was why he, what Freud was allu alluding to when he speaks about parent in your, in your voice and the child in your voice. Right? And then there's the adult, which is you. Okay. So says the Ramchal, we have some, the Yed Sahara normally is like, do that sin and do that sin, but not when you're in a very high level. When you're on a super high holy level, this is a good litmus test to know where you're holding. When your Yed Sahara is subtle with you and seemingly trying to ask you to do loads of mitzvahs, trying to push you harder. You know, when I was, as I think I told some of you last time, who was with me on, on, on Tuesday night, I explained that, that my passion growing up have to say wasn't this holy book wasn't really judaism spirituality was soccer was football you know and thank god i got over that because now i'm no longer upset that my team just got smashed by chelsea just now so it's not the end of the world because it's really insignificant it's in, unimportant but when i went to yeshiva when i went to israel and kind of decided to want to be a rabbi i was always facing hmm, am i should i still be playing football and i'll never forget there was this one scene in in, in my yeshiva where my it was like 10.30 at night. And I was trying at that time to be the one to go to sleep the last and to be the one earliest in the yeshiva, right? So I wanted to like, leave, like lock up and then open up in the morning, which is like literally burning the candle at both ends, not advisable. So it was, I forget, it was at 10 o'clock at night and my chavrus, so the person I was learning was literally saying, you've got to stay learning. And some of my friends who like to play football were saying, come on, Abi, we need you to play. You want, want it? And I was literally, there was a tug of war going on where my chavrus was saying, stay and learn. And my friends were saying, come play football. And I was like, ah, Hashem, what do I do? And probably at that time, I didn't have this assessing piety. I wasn't able to say, you know what? There's a mitzvah in the Torah, which says, you got to look after your body. Balance. Where's a bit of balance, Avi Hill? Right? I, I have to say, I wasn't that balanced at that time. I was a little bit hardcore. 
and I was a bit like all in and let's say let's just stick to reading this book like for literally 20 hours a day and that wasn't healthy and and I rejected playing football at that time and in hindsight it was a mistake I should have found more balance but that was was saying Avi you've got to stay learn you know you know the importance of learning Torah there's nothing more important than learning Torah you know Ruby Akiba didn't stop learning Torah to go and play football you know Rebham Kanievsky the number one in the generation doesn't still go and stop playing football in the middle of all any time they're just learning all day and that's what I wanted to be but actually in hindsight it was wrong because I wasn't there I wasn't there yet I wasn't ready for that level I needed more balance in my life and that was a good example where my from Yitzhahara was telling me not to play football at that time so what the Ramchal is saying the evil Yitzhahara finds an opening in this domain one who finds himself on very dangerous ground because there's many good things the Yitzhahara may reject as if they were harmful and many sins, it may turn into important mitzvahs. Meaning, the, like, I thought, oh, I'm not allowed to do exercise because I've got to learn 24-7. What am I doing? What am I thinking about? Wasting my time playing football. But I was wrong. Actually, the Torah says, you should look after your health. And I should have focused on that to find balance in my day. And then he says the following. He says, in reality, one must fulfill three requirements. Here we go. You ready for these three requirements? This is the prescription to find balance in your spiritual jungle. Number one, he must have the most truthful of hearts. You've got to be true. Yoshal Shebel Vobis, whose sole inclination is to please Hashem. If you're doing things for your ego, let's say there's a charity. A lot of people ask questions about charity, right? You have this charity do, charity function. How much charity should you give? We're going to get into that soon. If you're giving charity because it's good for your business networking and it's good for your name up in lights and you want like the world to like, whoa, you're amazing. You're given that. Then we're not, let's not even begin the discussion because that's coming from a place of ego. That's coming from a place of lower self. So there's nothing even to talk about. First and foremost, you've got to have what's called truthful of hearts. And I love this. Your, your reason, your motivation for why you should be spiritual is first and foremost to please Hashem, to please God. He must analyze his actions intensely and try. And so that's the step one was to be truth, to be pure of motivation. Second is to have analysis, to try and rectify them with a self, some purpose in his mind. You've got to constantly be checking in at the end of your day. Have a little journal. What went right today? What went wrong today? What could I have done better today? Be super honest with yourself. You know, we do this in business. At the end of business, you know, sometimes we think, you know, how did that deal go? How did that, the end of a project, we do that in project management. The most important project of your lives is your spiritual potential because that's the one you're going to be judged for for eternity in the next world. When you get to the next world, Hashem's not going to say, Larry, how did you do with that deal? You know, did you manage to... to you know, to, to recruit that agent. He's not going to ask that with all due respect, right? As much as I love you. That's not the question he's going to ask you. He's going to be asking you spiritual stuff. He's going to be how, how you were kind in that situation, ethical in that situation. You know, how are you able to deal with that mitzvah, not with that mitzvah? That's what we get asked. And we never we need introspection at the end of every day. And critically, he, he, he has this beautiful line from Tehillim. Where he says, Ashrei Odom Oiz Leivov, chapter 84, number six. Praiseworthy is the man whose strength is in you. Very deep. If you understand that your strength comes from Hashem. So let's say you, you're in business. And instead of saying, oh, I'm a master of deals. I'm the best deals. You know, I know how to sort this out. God forbid. You should be saying, without Hashem's help, you're nothing. Hashem wants to us to be a pauper overnight, God forbid we would be. We're totally vulnerable in the face of Hashem. And once you have that humility and understand your strength is Hashem in you, now we can talk. And therefore, if you understand that, then he will withhold no goodness from those who work in perfect innocence. It's a beautiful line. The job is to be innocent, to have this innocence. Things are this beautiful thing. A child, one of the reasons children are so spiritual, so spiritual. It says that Sarah, when she was 20 years old, she was as beautiful as when she was seven. Now, why would a seven-year-old girl be more beautiful than a 20-year-old girl? That's not the norm. 
And the answer explains the Maharal of Prague is the beauty that we're talking about with Sarah was this beauty of innocence. You know, sometimes if you see children who are, who are brought, brought up refined, who are brought up with kind of a Torah background at times, you see just, and they're almost like angels. They're truly, genuinely innocent. And then the goal is to retain that innocence as we grow, if only. That's the goal, to retain that innocence. So the King David is saying that is the goal. If you can be this perfect, if you can have perfect innocence, it's not naivety, it's, it's innocence. It's because you're not guilty of crimes, you're innocent of crimes, and, and you understand everything comes from Hashem, then no goodness is withheld from you. However, if he fails to fulfill one of these conditions, then he will never attain perfection. He's likely, God forbid, to stumble and fall, for his intentions are not the most selective and the purest, or for his lacks in the analysis that he's capable of doing, or if after doing all these, he doesn't place his trust in Hashem, it will be difficult. Yet, if he fills these three, three conditions, and this is the summary, number one, he calls it integrity of thought. I'm going to call it common sense. We've got to have common sense. Hashem has given you something called common sense. So I think my mom's listening. Our rabbi growing up was an amazing rabbi called Diane Lopian. Diane Lopian, in fact, it's your site around now-ish. And, and may Neshama have an aliyah. And Diane Lopian, he always used to say, there's four books of the code, -ish, the code of Jewish law, the Shulchan Aruch. There's four books. And Diane Lopian used to say, but the most important one is the fifth volume of the code of Jewish law. And there isn't a fifth volume. So what does he mean? The fifth volume is common sense. Use your brain. Hashem has given you a brain for a reason. Hashem wants us to be able to use our brain to apply the Code of Jewish Law, Torah. That's what I'm saying. If one doesn't yet know the Code of Jewish Law, if one doesn't yet know Torah, one has got to learn. And that's why I'm really happy you're joining me, because we're on the journey of learning. And that journey needs to continue. And at a certain point, or always during, I suppose, from wherever you are in the journey, Hashem has given you the most incredible gift of insight, which is common sense, which we meant to go and learn how to have that natural intuition. That's number one. Number two, Ion, which means analysis. Analysis. There's a, there's a part in our brain which gives us the power to introspect, to analyze, to review. That's pivotal in spiritual growth. And then, very interesting, Bitachon, which is not to be mistaken for Bitcoin, right? It's not that type of currency. Bitachon means trust in Hashem. Trust in Hashem, everybody. Total putting all your trust in Hashem. Feeling almost like, have you ever, ever played the game when you're falling and someone's catching you? That's almost the game we need to learn how to play every day with Hashem. Hashem says, let me, let me hold you. Let me catch you. Let me hold you. Let me, let me walk with you. Let me take you. And ironically, you all, you all know the story that the famous story about the footprints. In short, there's this, these two foot footprints walking. Someone has a dream, they see these two footprints, and then it goes more into narrower, narrower, narrower. And, and then you only see one step of one pair of footprints. And the guy wakes up with a nightmare saying, Oh my gosh, initially there was two, I was being escorted, I was being helped and now now i'm in the scary parts there's only one pair of footprints and that was hashem saying to you now those are just mine i'm holding you now i'm holding you if we can understand that actually when we're going through troubles and challenges and travails then mamish hashem is picking you up and you're being looked after as we learned last week in the Israel class actually those challenges make us they make us strong as my football manager here always says, you can't succeed without suffering, right? You need to suffer. So that suffering is what enables us to grow. So when stuff happens, which isn't to our liking, when there's illness or issues or trauma, then Hashem is really wrapping his arms around you, helping you, there for you. So the Ramchal says, we need to have knowledge of this the whole time and feel that Hashem is with us, looking after us. So those, let's repeat those three things. Number one, common sense. Number two, introspection. Number three, trust. And then he says, if you've got those, then you'll be fine. Next page, you'll walk securely and no harm will befall him. This is what Hannah prophesied in Samuel. He will protect the feet of his pious ones. If you're pious, then you're, you're protected. Back to the footprints. 
or another line from King David, chapter 37, he will not forsake his pious ones, they will be eternally protected. Meaning, if you really want Hashem to hold on and look after you, we do need to be pious, we need to be innocent, we need to be good, we need to be God-fearing. Very quickly, yes, Hashem loves everyone. He loves the whole of humanity. But there's a system out there, which I think I need to share with you. There's two ways Hashem runs the world. One is called Hashkocha Klolis, and one is Hashkocha Protis, which means general providence and individual providence. Let me explain. For the majority of the world, if someone has a broken leg, that's not because Hashem has decided because of their spiritual level, they need to have a broken leg because they're not playing that game. They're, they're very much in, involved in, in the natural world, in nature, in, in luck. People say, I was lucky today. I wasn't lucky today. That's how people can live their lives. And Hashem kind of backs out and lets you live out your own fate. However, that's not what we believe happens for those who want a much closer relationship to God. The Sadiqim say there's a system, this is the one that Hashem wants, which is what the Baal Shem Tov talks about, which is called Ashkocha Protis, which is individual providence, which is every little thing that happens is because Hashem has decided this is what you need for your growth. There's literally constant karma going on. Every action leads to a reaction. And therefore, what King David is saying if you feel that closeness to God, you'll never be forsaken. You'll never be forsaken. One of my favorite um, songs that I love to sing, I'm not going to regale you now with a tune, maybe later if you want, after a few more drinks. There's a beautiful song at the end of Grace After Meals. It says, Nar Hayisi. King David says, Nar Hayisi Gamasogati. When I was young, and at least when I grew up, below Raisi Sadik Neesov, I never saw someone who's righteous and be forsaken. I never saw someone who's righteous and forsaken. The question is, can David really, has he ever like been to Israel? Have he ever like gone to some of that very, these holy neighborhoods where they have very terrible poverty and there's terrible trauma and sickness and there's all sorts of chaos going on and they're seemingly very holy people? And the answer is that they're not forsaken. They're not, Hashem is with them. He's holding their hands. There's, there's a, there's a, they're not alone. They're not alone. If you're, if you're righteous, you're never alone. If you're righteous, you're never alone. Never alone. Sometimes this world doesn't map out the way we want it to because Hashem's got bigger plans. There's a bigger reasons. If you really understood why you're here, what role you have in bringing Mashiach, what role you have in context of all your previous incarnations, we believe in Gilgulim, reincarnations, then you'll understand maybe the seeming trauma you're going through, that's why it has to happen. But ultimately, you're never forsaken. That's what King David says. Below you are easy. Sadiq of you're at Sadiq. You're never forsaken. You're never by yourself. Even King David himself. King David himself, who went through so much, so much trauma, his family members are trying to kill him. And he's isolated in a cave. But he wasn't alone. Never alone. Because he knew Hashem was with me. And that's actually what, what stopped him being, being fearful. Okay, let's go a little bit deeper in this. Let's try and let's try and flesh it out a bit. What, what's the Ramchal saying here? So, first of all, so there's a great rabbi called Rabbi Yeshua Heller. This is the way he puts it. He says the following: Instead of tempting a person to sin, the Yitzhahara drives him to think that he's even more righteous than everyone else. I want to be super righteous. Right? We all want to be super, right? We all want to be the best. So it's very dangerous. If your Yitzhahara gets into you, I need to be the best in terms of my righteousness. I'm going to be the, the most God-fearing person on this planet, right? Super dangerous if you go down that route. By the way, what you're meant to say is I need to be the most God-fearing soul for me, right? I need to hit my potential. You know, one of the reasons I like golf is really you're not playing against anyone else. You're playing against yourself. There's a process called the handicap system where I can have a game against Rory McIlroy tomorrow, right? And maybe even win, depends on how much, you know, shots he gives me. Because you're really playing against yourself, you know? I'll let you into a secret. I, I play to 14, right? My handicap is 14, right? So, so that means if I play within my capabilities, I could beat the number one golfer. 
So it doesn't, so, so that's where we are all playing spiritually. You're playing against yourself. You're not playing against others. And then that will help you. But the Sahara, your lower self is way more cunning. Yes, no, no, I need to be better than him. I need to give more charity than that person. I need to learn more Torah than that person. And then I, I need to pray longer than that person. As soon as you're comparing yourself to others, you know it's the Eight Sahara. You know it's the Eight Sahara. The Chavetz Chaim wouldn't even dream of comparing himself to anybody. He just wants to be the best himself for Hashem. He's just trying to help Hashem, trying to, to help Hashem. We're living in such a messed up society where, let's say, in politics, and in the UK right now, it's chaos in our politics. I think in America, it's just as bad, right? Just chaos politically because everyone wants the top job, right? Everyone's trying to knife Boris Johnson and and the deputy prime minister would like him and, and the chancellor wants that job. Everyone wants the top job. Everyone's comparing themselves to others to try and get power. Spirituality is the opposite. The only power is Hashem. Right? The only power is God. Our job is to be of service to higher power. If you're of service, there shouldn't be a game. It shouldn't be competition. It should be whatever God wants me to do. You know, if God, one of my rabbis used to say to me, if God decides that on one Yom Kippur, you go to the bathroom and then the bathroom locks and breaks and, you're, and everyone's in synagogue and there's no phone. So you're stuck in the toilet on Yom Kippur. God forbid. Says my rabbi, that's because God, that's where God wants you. And therefore, if you're in the toilet, you're not allowed to pray. You're not allowed to learn Torah. So God would want you in the bathroom that young people, that's your spiritual job. That's where God wants you that year at that time. Where we find ourselves is where God puts us. And therefore, we shouldn't be comparing ourselves to others, but the Eight Sahara is going to, unfortunately, try and ensnare us. That the Chosset can be tempted only by the illusion of more spirituality and more piety. And this is the problem. The problem is the higher you go. And as I said, if this is your issue, at least it's a better issue than how it was a few years ago. Because where you start off, the issue is, I want to smash that person up. I want to take that person's property. I want to do things which are unethical. The higher you grow, it's like, I want to do that extra mitzvah. I want to be the one to do the mitzvah. You know, if you're in synagogue and you'll say, I want to be the one to open the ark. There's your ego. I want to be the one to lift up the Sefer Torah. I want to have the, the responsibility of letting the whole community see the Sefer Torah. I can do it best. And then it happens and people get really upset with the rabbi, who's called the Gabba, for picking someone else. Like, what about me? Hello? Do I look like chopped liver? Like, don't you know who I am? Like, hello, why don't you pick me? If ever you're getting brogus, you're getting upset because they didn't pick you in synagogue to do the gig, come and speak to me. We need to talk. There needs a lot of introspection. You need to do because you're not doing it for the right motives. If you're called upon, that's it. But if you're like trying to initiate, um, uh -huh, uh -huh, hello, can you pick me please? Hello, look. And then you're trying to catch the eye. You're missing the point. You should be like, if you're in synagogue, innocent, eyes down with your Psalms. And then if you're picked upon, that means that's what Hashem wants you to do. You're with me. Next. Oh, so this is amazing. One of my role models, who also was the York site last week, Rabbi Tversky. He's actually got a book. Rabbi Tversky's got a book on Bath the Trust, which I really recommend. It's called Lights Along the Way. So you can check it out, everybody. It's a really cool book. It could be your next present, right, to get yourself. It's important to buy yourself presents, especially if they're holy books. And, and the way Rabbi, T Rabbi Tversky talks about it is the following. So he gives a few examples. First of all, he quotes a, a Talmud in Yerushalmi in Sota, chap um, chapter three, which says the following. This is ill-advised piety. And again, I can't, you might think this is like bizarre. You wouldn't even dream of this, but c'est la vie. Someone who's super holy could get lost in this turmoil. Someone doesn't want to save a drowning woman because she's not wearing a lot of clothes and she's very beautiful and he's worried that um, he might have an affair with her. And, and I know people like that, right? They're going to be like, whoa, that's not to me. Let someone else save her. 
obviously, hello, someone's drowning, get in there, jump the heck in and save a life. Or someone who delays another person's rescue because I've got my tefillin on, right? I've got my tefillin on, right? By the way, on chat, I didn't see, basically, I think if, let me just ask what, see what Sivan was asking. Yeah, if you're in the bathroom or the toilet, especially now, put it off, right? Because that's one thing, we shouldn't be learning terror in the bathroom or the toilet. Whenever there's the room with no mezuzah, it's because, it's not because God's not there, because Hashem's everywhere, but there's a place Hashem says, no, that's where kind of what we call impurity exists. That's where you can be naked and you can go and sit on the toilet. And that's, we don't kind of mix. Terror. So you don't bring a holy book into the bathroom. You know, you, you, you don't bring a uh, tefillin into the bathroom, right? That, that's going to be important. That's why the great Vilna Gaon, this genius who was learning the whole, whole time, right? The whole, the whole time he was learning, he created a mathematical genius formula, which professors speak about because he needed something to do on the toilet, the Vilna Gaon. So he's like, okay, I've got to think maths, right? So he wasn't allowed to learn Torah. So he plays around with some mathematical formulas and came up with some genius. Maybe someone knows, maybe James can put it on our link. What's the famous Bill Nagon's mathematical formula, which people will speak about for years. But people don't realize these amazing finance, these mathematic professors who speak about it, you don't realize he made it up on the loo, guys, because he needs something to, to, to think about. You know, that's where I can think about football things, right? Some, some people, that's where they think about business, ironically, funnily enough. Apart from on Shabbos. On Shabbos, on the toilet, you can't think about, I don't know where we're going tonight. But the Shabbos on the toilet, you shouldn't be thinking about business either. So Shabbos on the toilet, go to sleep, right? L -l Lots of sleep, you can sleep. But um, <laughs> during the week, business, maths, sports, but no Torah, either in the shower or in the bath or on the toilet. Back to this. So what we're saying, the Talmud says, let's say you need to save someone. They're like, I've got my tefillin on. So let me take my tefillin off first. No, are you joking? Someone's in danger with your tefillin on, you jump in there. But you know, you start seeing the problem. Someone who's very holy and pious, they might be, oh, I can't put my tefillin in that situation. If we understood what tefillin were, which is really our Hashem's love for us, and God forbid someone's in distress, there's no, nothing more beautiful than taking your tefillin with you and saving someone with your tefillin on. That's exactly what Hashem wants. But in our false knowledge, in our from Yitzhaharaism, we think, whoa, I've got to first put my, my tefillin away. No, someone's in danger. Go save them. Number one, straight away. It's called Hikuach Nefesh. Someone's life's in danger. You are, you, you're, meant to, you're meant to break Shabbat if someone's life's in danger. Rabbi Tversky brings another example. He says, giving charity. It's a good example. Some people who are poor, they, they, they give too much charity. You know that? Thank you, James, has found the Vilnagon's theorem. And it's not an urban legend, it's true. So don't put that link on. Come on, man. All the links. Put the kosher links on, Jamesy boy. Kosher links. So here's the thing. So, so <sighs> Maimonides writes, there is actually, now, if you're a billionaire, and by the way, if any of you is a billionaire, then I've got some lovely charities that you can help with. But if you're not a billionaire or even a millionaire, you are allowed to give a lot more. But for most, what we call normal, ah, Joe blogs, as we call it in London, if you're average Joe blogs, then you shouldn't be giving. Do anyone know what, what's the limit you're meant to be giving? Between 10 and 20%. Normally 10%. If you want to be really firm, you can give up to 20% but not more than 20%, because if you're putting yourself in financial poverty, and then you're gonna, someone's gonna have to go and knock on someone else's door, for your sake, what are you giving charity? So Rabbi Tuerf, he spoke about a very amazing story. He said his father obviously was a rabbi, and one day this very poor man came and gave his father $100 for, for, a, for a cause, and, and, and the, his father did what most people don't do, and gave the money back. He says, nah, you're joking, you, you're not allowed to give a hundred, you know, I wanna give you $100 back, that's not, you're not the one that Hashem wants it to come from. You got Because for him, he couldn't afford it. You shouldn't be giving people charity stuff you couldn't afford. Rabbi Tversky said something very chilling at that point. He says, many years later, that man became very wealthy. And when he became very wealthy, he didn't give charity. 
He was actually a miser, which is fascinating, which shows that when there's imbalance, it's not coming from a healthy place. It's a really deep idea, everybody. It's worth coming tonight just to hear this point. Spirituality should be coming from a healthy place. If you're in a place of self-love and self-confidence and, and in a healthy relationship to God, that's how we're meant to do mitzvahs. But if it's coming from a place of extreme extremism, you know, extremity, from irrationality, imbalance, it's not healthy. It's not coming from a good place. So someone who's very poor, who's giving a lot of charity, is actually not because they're that kind. You think it's because they're that kind. And Robert Tversky said, look, look at that guy. Years later, when he became a multimillionaire, he was, he was a miser who comes up because he was imbalanced then as well. So it wasn't, it was for his ego. It actually wasn't for God, which is a really deep idea. But essentially, charity is a good example of don't try and be too charitable at the consequence and expenses of your family, like your family miss out, your wife misses out because you're giving charity too much. Like charity begins at home. First and foremost, you've got to make sure your loved ones are taken care of. But at the same time, 10% isn't yours. 10% is just not your money. Now, the truth is, if, if your one is, God forbid, on, on the poverty line, then it doesn't apply to you. If you're on the poverty line, and literally, you know, you can't make ends meet and you can't pay the bills and you've got it on the street and then someone gives you $100, you don't have to give them $1. Or sorry, I say that's my, my math. So I'm not the donor gun, right? <laughs> you're not meant to give $10 at that point away. Whereas us, thank God, who so are on Zoom right now, so we can't be on that much poverty if we're on Zoom, right? So when, let's say 100 pounds comes to R, then 10 of it's not ours. It's just not ours. That's the way we meant to look at it. 10% is not ours. But let's not be too zealous about it. He gives another story. Remember I spoke about my mistake when I went to Yeshiva, that I kind of thought, oh, if I'm going to become great, I should never sleep ever again. And I was like up till about three in the morning and got up again about six in the morning. So the Chobetz Chaim, if I would have been in the Chobetz Chaim's yeshiva, I wouldn't have done that. Just said the Chobetz Chaim would go to the study hall at night and send the students off to sleep. So midnight, he would shut the lights out. No one's allowed to stay here after midnight. Go to bed. You need to look after your body. Again, the Chobetz Chaim, one of the greatest spiritual sages we've had for the past 200 years, who himself got to that level where he didn't need that much sleep. But for his boys in studying in the academy, go to sleep. And, and the great Sadiq was putting people to sleep. And he said that the urge to continue learning into the wee hours of the morning is actually the Yitzhahara. Why? Because eventually you'll get so tired, you'll like give up. The Yitzhahara is happy for you to do a little bit more now if he can destroy you in the future. And therefore, for many of you who are spiritually growing, it's really important you don't do too much too quick and get to a place of feeling overawed, feeling it's too, I'm overwhelmed. It's really important that with your spirituality, you grow slowly one step at a time. That's why another reason I say like rab, you're meant to have your own rabbi, your own mentor who knows you, understands you, who can guide you slowly and try and get you to something long term. So the Chovetz Chaim felt that people needed to go to sleep. And again, I wish I had that in my issue. I wish I had that, right? Because I was able to stay up till three and then come back at six and, and it wasn't healthy. Okay, let's go back to the Ramchal. Let's go back to the words of the Ramchal. Says the Ramchal, he brings a story. <clears throat> and it's a very sad story. It's a confusing story. And I've got to give a bit of the caveat to the story. So again, if James wants to put the link of that story, it's found, it's found in the Talmud, in Tractate Gittin. Tractate Gittin. Um, page 55b. 55b in Gittin, in the Talmud. This is where the story comes from. Some of you might know it. It's a very famous story. It's the story which was the catalyst of, I can repeat that, Gittin, G-I-T-I-N, Page 55b to 56a. There was a certain man who had a friend named Kamsa and an enemy named Bar Kamsa. One time he made a big meal, big party. And Bar Kamsa 
the enemy was inadvertently invited instead of his good mate, Kamsa. By the way, it could easily happen for the Jews, like Mr. Cohen, right? You know, I want Mr. Cohen to come, but I actually hate the other Mr. Cohen, and then the wrong Mr. Cohen comes to the party. So the host insisted in ejecting Bar Kamsa from the meal. Can you imagine, right? You're making this party and your enemy comes. Now, hopefully, what would you do? You spiritual people who now come to my class, you say, oh, that's what Hashem wanted. Hashem would want him to come to Seder. Let him come. Let me enjoy. Hashem's got a sense of humor. I'm obviously meant to learn. So I need to is thinking that's exactly what I would say. Good. But unfortunately, this guy wasn't in my classes. So he didn't know that. And he just saw his enemy there. And he's like, there is no way I'm giving one drink to my arch foe. He's out of here. He is out of the party. We're chucking him out. But Bar Kamsa was so humiliated, he was so embarrassed, and he came and spoke to the guy privately and said, listen, please don't embarrass me. Please don't throw me out of the party. At the very least, let me pay for my, let me pay for my meal so it's not costing you a penny. I get it. You don't want to pay for me. I'll pay. Just don't, don't throw me out. Like everyone's here. Like it'll be the biggest scandal if I'm thrown out of the party. Don't do that to me. The guy said, get out of my party. He said, okay, I'll pay half your party. I'll pay half of it. 50%. Come on, deal. You're Jewish, you should like a bit of a business deal. The guy said, get out. I said, okay, I'll pay all of it. By the way, that's not a bad deal, right? Hello. You, you get the whole party paid for. But the guy was so angry, he said, get the heck out right now. And he got the big bailiffs to go and literally start carrying him out. But there were some sages who were at the party. Some of the leaders of the community were there and they didn't say anything. And they were silent, which is, by the way, really interesting. Because next time, because we are faced with this, if you see some acrimony, if you see a conflict play out in front of you, what are you meant to do? Should you step up and try and help? Sometimes that can make it worse. Should you sit back quiet? Sometimes you sit back quiet. Sorry to say this, Cyril, like Switzerland did. That's not the right idea either, right? To, to, to just say nothing, right? So... What are you meant to do? Anyway, they were silent. And now this guy, Barakamsa, was thrown out. He says, oh, that's it. Because the, especially the sages didn't do anything. I'm going to retaliate. And he went to the Caesar. This happened with the Romans during the time of the Second Temple. He went to the Caesar and said, these Jews, they don't like you. They're pretending to like you. They don't like you. And I can prove it. If you would go and ask them to offer an offering to show their allegiance to the Caesar, they won't do it. And the Caesar says, well, of course they will. They look at our mates. We're getting on well at the moment. They have respect. Let's try it out. So he went and gave an offering and sent the offering along with his officers to the, Jew to the Jews. And Bar Kamsa went, took a knife, made a blemish in the eye of the animal, a cataract, which made it an invalid offering. Now on, it's an invalid offering. It's called a mum. Created a blemish as a mum. Now, let me ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen, who've now hopefully activating common sense. Think about it. On one hand, in Jewish law, one is not allowed to offer up an offering with a blemish. No doubt. No doubt. And if you do, and people know there's a cataract, it could lead to other people thinking, Oh, the rabbi has allowed us to make an offering with a cataract. Obviously, cataracts aren't a blemish. On the other hand, on one hand, that's not the way we normally offer things up. On the other hand, hello, it was the Caesar. It's the Romans. They're mighty. They're strong. They could kill you and every single one of you. If they say jump, maybe you should say how high. If it's, you know, there's only three things you've got to give up. You've got to say no to. You want to write... Anyone want to write down what those three things are? There are three things you're meant, Hashem asks you to give up your life for. Three things. Number one, idolatry. They ask you to worship an idol. They ask you to commit adultery. Or if they ask you to commit murder, then you have to say, no, thank you. If you're going to kill me, kill me. But not to offer up an offering in an incorrect manner. But unfortunately, there was a rabbi. And now let's look at the Ramchal. Now let's go back to the path of the just. He says, the second base Amigdos was destroyed by the piety of this nature. 
The sages advises that the blemished animal, the Bar Kamsa brought as a sacrifice, should be offered. But this rabbi called Zachariah ben Avkolas, this guy called Zachariah, he thought he was being really firm and really zealous and really holy and going the extra mile and said that they would assume it's permissible to sacrifice a blemished animal. It's like people who are very bureaucratic, who's just like going, following, following the rules without using one's common sense. Zachariah said, no, they will assume you can't do it. We can't offer it up. And by the way, they said we can't go and kill. They're worried this bar council was going to go and report. They knew they could see the problem. They could see the writing on the wall. They could see if they weren't going to offer it up. This bar council could go and tell on them to the Caesar. So they actually had a debate. Should we kill bar council? She said, no, no. They would assume the one who blemishes the sacrifice offering is punishable by the death penalty. So what happened during the course of events, the evildoers went off and slandered the community of Israel. The emperor came and destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the base of Mikdash, Tishabav. We're still in mourning now. We're still nearly 2,000 years later. Don't have a beautiful temple. A lot because this guy, Zachariah, was being very from. No, we can't offer up that offering, says the Ramchal and part of the just. This is what Rabbi Yochanan said, the humility of Rabbi Zakaria destroyed our temple. It burnt our sanctuary, it exiled us amongst the nations. That's the greatest example of being too firm, of being too holy, of not being balanced in one's spirituality. If you're going to be so extreme, you don't care what the consequences are, and we lose our temple, you've really missed the point. And the Ramchal's being strong. There's this amazing phrase. Which King Solomon write, which is alt yet sadik harbe. Don't be too firm. Don't be an excessive sadik. Our job is to become sadikim, if only, to be righteous, not to be excessively righteous. It's funny, I think with wealth, people think, I don't just want to be wealthy, I want to be excessively wealthy. I don't want to be just good looking, I want to be excessively good looking. When it comes to spirituality, there's no concept of, I need to be excessively righteous. Righteous is good enough, if only, if only. So that, that's, that's a good example over there. Let's continue. In the, in the next one, we'll finish off with this. There's a command in the Torah, and the command in the Torah is called, there's a mitzvah to rebuke your fellow man. So if you see someone doing a sin, on one hand, it says in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17, you should... Tell them off. You should say, it's wrong. This is the way you're meant to do it. So let me ask you, what are you meant to do? You're meant to like stand outside McDonald's and any Jewish person that walks in, try and like call the police. Do you know what I mean? Like, like cart them off, try and like, no, 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 don't do it. It's non-kosher food. That's not the way to work. That's not the way it works. And so he says on numerous occasions, one undertakes to rebuke sinners at a place or a time when his words will not be accepted thereby causing them to press onwards with their meaning. And this is the key point. And this is how Maimonides puts it. You should only rebuke if it's going to work. You should only say something to someone if someone's at home that they want to hear that information. If you're going to be all like, oh my gosh, I'm so inspired by Rabbi Hill's path for just last tonight. That's it. I can't tolerate any inconsistencies anymore. I've got to proclaim it from the rooftops and anyone that now speaks evil gossip about I'm going to go and glue their lips together. No, you're not meant to do that. You're only ever meant to mention to someone that they're doing something wrong if it's going to help, if they're interested in listening, if they want to hear, if they're open, if they're on that journey. If they're interested at all, if it's going to actually make a positive difference, we call it in Hebrew to'elet. If it's constructive, if it's not, then rather let's not go there. Rather let's not go there. So it's very interesting. It's about like people do that for people who are smoking, right? They start like screaming at people who are smoking and taking away their cigarettes. Probably makes them smoke more, right? You probably, they, they, they're, they're so stressed by the end of that experience, they go and smoke even more. Right, so you've got to know how to do it, when to do it. And then Rabbi Twersky says something very interesting, because I also have this issue. As rabbis, what we get asked, we get asked some interesting questions. We get asked, am I allowed to speak Goshen Hara about this person? 
I'll give you examples. This is where Robert Tesky said it. He says, I received an inquiry regarding a shidduf, so re regarding a few exceptions when you, can be, when you are allowed to share negative information. And one of those is if you know someone wants to marry someone. So if you're, if you're a matchmaker, for example, or if you know, one, one of you says, oh, I've got this single friend and that single friend, you want to match them together, but let's say one of them has got schizophrenia. So they've got schizophrenia. So, and they had it when they were a bit younger. Do I have to share that information? So we get asked that, as rabbis get asked that, am I allowed to share this information if there was mental illness? Am I permitted to reveal it? So first of all, actually one really has to reveal these things at a certain time. Maybe not at the very beginning, but we're not meant to be hiding important pieces of information. You are allowed to reveal it. But then Robert Swirsky says, most cutting comments, he says, I can't help but wonder why this is the only time people are concerned about Lashon Hara. If people would consult a rabbi every time, they're about to say something negative about someone else, the telephone company would have to erect a huge, fully computerized building to handle all the volume of calls. Think about it. Can you imagine if every time a Jew was person was about to speak Lashon Hara, calls up their rabbi, the rabbi wouldn't have the senkud to breathe because people are speaking Lashon Hara right, left, and center. So it's really interesting for some people, oh, they act all holy. Oh, I'm not sure. Should I say this information? I need to check out with the rabbi. Now, again, by the way, you are meant to check out with the rabbi on certain information. So let's say whether it's for business, for relationships. Are you allowed to share certain information? It is healthy to share it at that point. But the point Rabbi Twersky is making, making is, mm, I don't see the consistency. If you really cared about Lashon Hara, then you should be calling up the rabbi the whole time. And people aren't. Because when you're with your friends in the bar, chilling out, you know, kicking back, you're happy to kind of like goss a bit and, 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 chit, and, 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 ch and chat about, you know, your uncle or your cousin or that person or this person. And really the Torah says we're not allowed to do that. As many of you know, as I said before, there's one verse in the Torah about eating pork. It says the Chobetz Chaim, there are 31 of the 613 commandments we break every time we say evil information about someone else. If you say that David is a miser, that, you know, that David is a, an adulterer, that David is a thief, we've just broken 31, potentially up to 31 mitzvahs of the Torah. So we need to be super careful. But on the other hand, we need to know that there's a time and a place. And there are some times when it could be wise to say those negative informations. Because my friends, in summary, spirituality is complicated. Like, it's not just like, hey, I just need to keep the 613 mitzvahs and it's easy. Sorry, it's really complicated because life's fluid. And during the pandemic has, has created a whole new range of questions. And who knows what's around the corner? And but that's the beauty of spirituality. And that's why Orthodox Judaism is so amazing because you have this, on one hand, timeless system where the Torah that Hashem revealed to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses is still as relevant today in 2022, but it goes alongside what's called the oral law, which is this chain of transmission where we, where we need to be able to apply modernity to this truth. And for that, we need, A, you need sages, you need mentors, you need knowledge, and you need common sense. So that's where we're up to. We'll take a stop there. So I would, you know, I'm sure you've got your next rabbi you're going to go and listen to the, uh, at nine o'clock my time. I'm convinced, obviously, because what else would you do in life other than just listen to rabbis all day? So I wish you well. Any questions? Happy to take any questions. Any questions, everybody? And please join me on Tuesday night for a intense Soda Kakoin talk on Mishpatim. It's going to be about the Kabbalistic roots of Shabbos this week. It's going to be hopefully an emotional journey this Tuesday night. Any questions? Anybody got any question? Yeah, very good. Even, even, even good speech about someone, especially if you say good things, James, to someone you know who doesn't like the person, and then they're going to say, uh, 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 hold on. They're not that good. I know the real story. I know what's going like on behind the scenes, so you have to be really careful even to say good things about someone. So that's why sometimes it's just better to probably sit on the toilet and do lots of maths. All right, guys, so that was a joke, by the way. 
Um, what if you're talking about your children? Sivan, what does that mean? So first of all, your children, I'm sure, are amazing and beautiful and perfect because, you know, of course. But obviously, if let's say they've done something which needs education, there I even say needs a bit of discipline, then it does need to be discussed, but it doesn't need to be discussed with the wrong person. You know, it's not like on, it's on a need to know basis. It's really important. Lashon Hara is all negative criticism is on a need to know basis. It shouldn't be like discussed on social media, on your Twitter account, right? It shouldn't be discussed to maybe your friends, to your daughter's friends' parents. Like things need to be handled and you need to know to be discreet, you know, who, who, who we can discuss it with. But yes, to bring up your kids and if they are at times going slightly on the wrong path, which happens, yes, those things should be discussed at the right time. The Rabbi Tatshe Adina is on the 1st of February, please God, if Hashem wills it. So that's it. I'm, I'm off and I'll see you all later. Please God, I'll see you all on Tuesday night. Thank you so, so much for joining. Really, really appreciate it. Join me on, on subscribe to J Network 6.3 on YouTube if you haven't yet. Lots of love. Wishing you bracha, batzlacha, tremendous blessings and success in all areas to all of you. Lots of love. Good night, guys. Good night. That's me out.